Hello, my name is Neil Robertson. I'm the director of the Early Modern Studies program uh, here at King's, one of the three upper year programs that you may have uh, been introduced to already. Uh, and um, un I understand Newton was actually an early modernist. Uh, so I've been asked to just uh, introduce our uh, speaker the beginning this afternoon sessions uh, and uh, just to say a few words of introduction about him. Paul Greenham, uh, and he's coming to us from the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology at the University of Toronto, where he is uh, in uh, the final stages, uh, towards the final stages of a PhD that's looking at Newton's uh, alchemy and uh, theology, and um, he has the privilege of, and honor of having uh, uh, Steve uh, Snowblin uh, on, his, uh, on his committee there. Um, he uh, did an undergraduate degree at uh, the University of uh, Pennsylvania and a Master of Divinity along the way, and he's in the process of uh, being involved in a project that's um, concerned with um, Al-Razzi's uh, alchemy uh, that is going to be coming out uh, with uh, Rutledge uh, in terms of Islam and science. So a multifaceted background that uh, he brings to the topic that he's discussing uh, this afternoon, classical theism in Newton's general scholium. All right, thank you. So um, I am actually going to be approaching this topic. I'm not, I don't consider myself a theologian, let me just put that out there, but I'm going to be approaching it theologically uh, um, in some ways as if I were a theologian to give more of the background. So let's see, is this the, there we go. Uh, so I'm going to be looking at new classical theism in Newton's uh, general scholium. And I hope you don't mind, I'm mostly going to be staying on my notes here. I've rewritten them so that I can stay on time and still get to everything I want to do because I tend to ramble if I'm free. So let's, uh, let's, continue. let's start here. In this talk, I treat the general scholium as a theological piece, a work of natural theology. As a work of natural theology, it is not in isolation. A number of the presentations at this workshop give us the various contexts for the general scholium, and they, they will be giving us especially the immediate context, the religious context. So I'm not actually going to be detailing those uh, associations um, as strongly. And Steve's paper, for example, is one of those, and the next two that we'll be discussing uh, are similar, and there are other, other papers, I think, that will be doing the same sort of thing. However, even given Newton's 17th and 18th century envir uh, environment, I argue that there's a larger context which goes beyond Newton's immediate religious surroundings, that of the classical theistic tradition. The general scholium, as natural theology, fits into a tradition of natural theology. Hence, one of my methods, as you will see, has been to rearrange some of the major to theological topics in the general scholium to fit an approach more common to systematic theologies. This insight, I think, allows, though this, I think, allows insight into Newton's overall theology. Newton broaches what it means to refer to a being as God and presents the nature of the true God according to categories used by the major systematizers of Christian and Jewish thought, such as God's power, duration, and place. So what do I mean by classical theism? Classical theism refers to the doctrine of God that considers God's nature and attributes. The God of classical theism is the God of the philosophers, understood in light of Greek philosophical concepts, which were introduced in early Christian apologetics, rather than the narrative accounts of the Bible. There are, of course, other, uh, other religious uh, contexts for classical theism. It's not uh, strictly um, confined to Christianity. You have Jewish classical theism, you have uh, Muslim classical theism, and you could perhaps even argue uh, some of the other religious contexts as well, pagan classical theism to some degree. Um, however, the uh, Christian tradition of classical theism typically finds its ultimate expression in the system of Thomas Aquinas, but it incorporates patristic and medieval theologians such as Augustine and Anselm, as well as later developments in scholasticism. And while the reformers rhetorically distanced themselves from such non-scriptural theological considerations, they incorporated its organizational structure and concern themselves with the same central topics, especially regarding discussions of God's nature. So let me move on to a little overview. Uh, specifically, I'm going to look at the theistic tradition. So what is, uh, what is the theistic tradition that Newton is inheriting? And then I'm going to look at three specific elements within classical theistic uh, 
um, tradition that Newton is using. There's, there are more, but I'm going to look specifically at these. One is justification for theology from nature. The second is the nature of God, which I show as absolute, or I talk about as absolute dominion. And then the attributes or perfections of God. Perfections is the way it's uh, introduced in the classical um, theistic tradition. And I'm looking at eternal and infinite, although there are others like omniscience, uh, for example. All right. So Newton and the classical theistic tradition. Intellectuals in the Western tradi Christian tradition attempted a full synthesis of natural philosophy with theology in the 13th century, assimil assimilating newly translated Aristotelian texts and their Islamic commentators into an already developed theology centered on Augustine and the later work of Anselm, Abelard, and Peter Lombard. This synthesis culminated in the Summa Theologica of Thomas Aquinas and created the scholastic curriculum of the universities, which would persist even in post-Reformation Cambridge to the end of the 17th century. By Newton's day, scholastic referred to both the form of Aristotelian logic and rhetoric and the Christianized Aristotelian world system. Newton encountered this tradition as part of his initial reading at Cambridge. His Trinity notebook reveals extensive citations from 17th century summations of Aristotelian natural philosophy, the Physiologiae Peripatetica of uh, Johannes Magaris, and the scholastic metaphysics, the axiomata of Daniel Stahl. And you can see this is actually a uh, piece from a page from his Trinity notebook uh, dealing with the axiomata. Uh, Stefan Duchesne has argued that this Aristotelian textbook tradition contributed to certain methodological patterns in Newton's natural philosophy. Moreover, William Wallace locates the first source of Newton's confidence in the god of natural philosophy in his early scholastic reading. Newton's sort notes on Stahl, and I've put them right here, uh, indicate his early interest in God's role in causality, as he wrestled with primary and secondary causation in the matter of human sin and the general operations of the natural world. And here's the piece on uh, the doctrine of causes and causation. Newton's scholastic phase, however, was short-lived. His later writings treat the scholastics, or schoolmen, in an exclusively negative manner lumping them together with Cartesians, Kabbalists, and idolatrous pagan philosophers in their love of metaphysical speculation and sophistry. Yet Newton continued to engage in their project, even as he repudiated and modified their ideas. Time does not permit a detailed excursion into Newton's theological sources, but I do want to highlight one aspect. Newton's initial book purchases at Cambridge included the Institutes of John Calvin and annotations on the New Testament by Calvin's disciple, Theodore Beza. Newton later attacked Beza's treatment of 1 John 5-7 in the suppressed two notable corruptions. Yet his early reading of the Bible and Christian doctrine was influenced uh, and through Calvinist lenses. Newton's own theological writing is not doc doctrinally organized. Most of it addresses themes related to early church history and the interpretation of prophecy. The general scholium, however, offers a concise presentation of Newton's theological views, particularly regarding the nature and attributes of God the specific concerns of the classical theistic tradition. And to better display the systematic features of the general scholium, I've restructured his argument according to a more traditional order. And this is an order that you see in systematic theologies throughout. Even if you look at it today, if you take a systematic theology off the shelf, you'll see you know, justification for the process, etc. But I'm going to use Aquinas as our uh, model. So let's look at Aquinas's kind of, if you take the summa and break it down into some of the major approaches, we can see it here. Aquinas' Summa Theologica was an exhaustive treatment of Christian theology, building from first principles and incorporating the disputative form of the medieval schools. Its theological topics formed the blueprint for subsequent systematic approaches to theology, the first few of which can be found in the general scholium. So I say these first three you do see in the general scholium. These last three, not so much. Um, and the last three, some for obvious reasons. Trinity is not necessarily going to be dealt with, although we can say it's dealt with in a, uh, it might be dealt with in a negative fashion, as has been argued. Uh, the other is likely because they are further removed from natural or experimental philosophy in Newton's mind. Well, I can give no details here. I think that Aquinas' five ways of proving the existence of God are in fact present in the general scholium. The first and second <coughs> in Newton's overall reasoning from effects to causes leading to the supreme cause, the causum summa. Aquinas' third way is seen in Newton's references to God as a necessarily existent being. The fourth way can be seen in God's supremacy. God is the superlative of dominion, extension, duration, etc. 
And the fifth way is quite clear in God's governance of things. So looking at the general scolium, I've uh, reworked them. So going same first three, uh, here I look at the nature of this is natural theology. And I think that you can see these aspects in Newton's um, analysis. The existence and nature of God, sovereign and spirit, and the attributes of God. Now the red ones are the ones I'm going to talk about today, so I don't have time to go into all of them. Um, however, this is, this is how I've organized it. So I've rearranged them to fit the Thomistic categories, as you can see. All right. So Newton ends the theological section of the General School with this famous quote, as we've, we've already been discussing this. His justification for making theological statements in a work of experimental and natural philosophy, and thus much concerning God, etc. In this endorsement of natural theology, Newton is not alone. In the ways he navigates what can be known of God from nature, he follows certain patterns in classical theism. One of the first tools Newton uses is nescience, the unknowability of God. As he, I quote, as a blind man has no idea of colors, so we have no idea of the manner by which the all-wise God perceives and understands all things. And the reason I bring this out is very much a classical theistic idea. This is common to most theological discussion. God is a being so different from us that the question arises as to how we can say anything about his essence. The fourth century Hilary of Poitiers puts it thus, quote, God is so far beyond the power of comprehension that the more the infinite spirit would endeavor to encompass him to any degree, the more the infinity of a measureless entity would surpass the entire nature that pursues it. Yet Newton does make positive, or to use the theological language, cataphatic statements about God. If God is so utterly other, how are we able to know him? We know him by his most wise and excellent contrivances of things and final causes. We can know Newton, I mean, we can know God, excuse me. <laughs> we can know God through studying his effects. This is a central theme to Newton's writings and comes out in his theological manuscripts as well. In a commentary on 2 Kings 17, he asserted that God was, was to be worshipped not so much for his essence as for his actions. The idea that God is known from his effects, his creative work, is the essential justifying principle in natural theology, and it finds biblical support in Romans 1.20. Aquinas uses this principle, arguing that we can go beyond negative or apophatic statements about God's nature, since effects are like their causes. It is possible to describe an unseen and unknown cause by examining its effects. In what he calls the analogy of being, we can speak of God in the language of causes and effects. Kelvin likewise, is, oops, excuse me. Kelvin likewise asserts, I quote, his essence indeed is incomprehensible, utterly transcending all human thought. But on, one, on each one of his works, his glory is engraven in characters so bright, so distinct, and so illustrious that none, however dull and illiterate, can plead ignorance as their excuse. Both Aquinas and Kelvin appeal to Romans 1.20, which, which is quoted here on the frontispiece to Clark's demonstration from 17, I think the first was 1704, this is the 1706 edition. So you can see it here quoted, and I'll read it for you. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. I could not find a direct uh, quotation in Newton's writings of this verse. It would be very interesting if we could find it. However, its use here in Clark definitely shows that um, it's understood by his contemporaries and it's uh, a justification for their particular approach to knowledge of God. In classical theism, however, the degree to which God can be known from nature is debatable. There is a tension between the God of natural theology and revealed theology, specifically on God's immutability and impassivity. William of Ockham, claimed that natural knowledge of God was not possible. We need revelation. And for Kelvin, although God's attributes or perfections could be seen through nature, and this is actually through a contemplation of ourselves, uh, similar to Newton's analogous language in the general scolium, this awareness is corrupted into idolatry. You might catch some similar language here. And rather, scripture is needed to behold God in his providence, to interpret creation. So what about Newton? How does he reconcile his natural knowledge of God with revealed religion. And this is where I go to the quote that Steve actually gave us a little earlier. And it's, it, I think this is an uh, interesting question, something that um, I want to think through. I'm not exactly sure I have a full solution, but I'm gonna add a, a few comments on it. The religion and philosophy be preserved distinct. We are not to introduce divine revelations into philosophy, nor philosophical opinions into religion. So what is he doing in the general scolium? Uh, this is a part of experimental philosophy. 
And it's not a religious treatise, it is a philosophical one. However, he says philosophy can most certainly speak about God, but outside of divine revelations. Hence, Newton doesn't use scripture as the basis for his assertions. His argument is based on things visible, on the appearances of things, on phenomena. However, Newton does use scripture. It is the ultimate source, I, I think, for God as Pantocrator. And his quote from Acts 17, we have, in him we live and move and have our being. This is scripture involved in the, in the general scholium. So this, this uh, verse, in him we live and move and have our being, I have here the 1713 and 1726 editions. In the first one we just have, it says, and thus said the ancients, um, and he gives us erratus and then scriptural quotes, and this one he expands it into a whole lot of ancients and his little comment on idolatry at the end. This note itself, I think, is an interesting evolution, the set of scriptural references, and the choice of these references actually demonstrates a connection to the classical theistic tradition. Uh, a number of the Old Testament references are used by uh, Jewish commentators on God's location, God's place. And uh, so we can see this, this connection to the, to the tradition, even in his choice of the scriptures. In the 1713 edition, he added, thus thought the ancients, as I said, and the 1726 has more. Here Newton echoes Calvin's insistence, um, oh sorry, this, uh, in this comment on the idolaters, he, uh, he gives this list, and then he gives a caveat regarding their idolatrous myopia, which prevented them from rightly interpreting the phenomena. Here Newton echoes Calvin's insistence on the primacy of scripture. The way Newton uses scripture in the Act 17 quote and the marginal note reveals his movement across the boundaries of revealed and natural theology. I suspect it only goes one way though, and perhaps demonstrates an a priori nature of Newton's divine metaphysics, as Andrew Janiak terms it. Thus, the original quote establishing boundaries is more to keep metaphysics out of religion. So much for Newton's justification of the process. Let's turn to his views of God's nature and attributes. All right, so the nature of God. Newton begins his main discourse on God with an extensive discussion of the inherent relationship between absolute power and true divinity. It is the dominion of a spiritual being which constitutes a God. Then he later says, and it is from his true dominion that it follows that the true God is a living, powerful, and intelligent being, and from his other perfections that he is supreme and most perfect. The scholarship on Newton's statement of God's dominion is fairly extensive, so I'll not go into too much detail here. However, I find it telling that dominion, or sovereignty, as it is usually referred to in, in the theological tradition, is more than an attribute here. It is part of what constitutes the divinity of God. And then dominion, combined with supremacy, makes the true God the one and only God. Newton is answering the question of what is God? What is his essence? Other gods, whether they are imaginary or not, are spiritual beings with some power, but God has universal power. Other beings have duration in time and extension in space, but God has universal duration and universal extension. Yet supremacy applied to space and time, making God eternal and infinite, does not make him God. All things have duration and extension, but only gods are sovereign spirits. And there's only one true and sovereign supreme spirit. All right. To understand Newton's view of the nature of God, it's helpful to compare it to some of the major classical theistic positions. So I've listed some, of the, uh, listed some of them to compare them, not all of which I think have, uh, were int of interest to Newton, but I want to just let you see. And some focused on God's supremacy or perfection as his essence. If you remember his uh, argument, God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. Anselm's God is also self-existent, which is a property that Aquinas shifts the focus towards. For Aquinas, God's essence is essence, usia, being, existence. Aquinas quotes from Hilier of Poitiers, saying, quote, existence does not add anything to God. It is his very substance, end quote. For Aquinas, the central nature of God is existence, and this nature connects all the rest of his theological system, including God's relationship to the natural world as upholding its existence, and undergirds all of God's attributes. I argue that for Newton, dominion and supremacy for, perform this systematic function. An alternative example is Martin Luther, whom Newton seems to have had no interest in and whose view of God he would have rejected. Luther makes the divine disclosure in Christ, and specifically Christ's suffering on the cross, central to the nature of God himself. God's nature is a divine paradox, the suffering and triumphant, an unappealing idea to Newton's Unitarian sympathies. Finally, what are the theologians who do seem to have focused on God's sovereignty, specifically Augustine and Calvin? Their emphasis of God's sovereignty does have parallels with Newton, but one major difference between the two arises in the area of grace. 
For Augustine and Calvin, God's sovereignty is tempered by his grace. They always go hand in hand. It is grace that even some are predestined to salvation. And it is grace that the natural world is held in control by God. Newton says little of grace. Even his discussions of mercy and forgiveness uh, do not have the unmerited flavor that the uh, theological concept of grace does in Augustine or Calvin. Even Christ's sacrifice on the cross is an example of perfect obedience. It is what I see as the moral influence interpretation of the atonement, which is traditionally ascribed to Peter Abelard, rather than an absorption of guilt. Yet Newton's views of God's sovereignty do fit into discussions of providence in the classical theistic tradition, as is seen in Kelvin's description. So here is Kelvin gives us um, a description of providence. He says, the providence we mean is not one by which the deity, sitting idly in heaven, looks on what is taking place in the world, but one in which he, as it were, upholds the helm sorry, holds the helm and overrules events. Hence it appears that providence consists in action. What many talk of bare prescience is the merest trifling. Those do not err quite so grossly who attribute government to God, but still, as I have observed, a confused and promiscuous government which consists in giving an impulse and general movement to the machine of the globe in each of its parts, but does not specifically direct the action of every creature. The Newtonian divine clockmaker who intervenes now and then to correct things or sends a comet now and then to affect it, which I think you can see a bit more in Clark, might fit with Calvin's confused government over here uh, rather than his absolute rule. However, if David Gregory is to be believed in his statement of Newton's view that God continuously causes gravity and the central role gravity plays in every action of the Newtonian system, then Newton's God of Dominion looks quite similar to Calvin's providential deity. Newton's emphasis on God's dominion appears to be a unifying principle in his theology, much as being or essence is in Aquinas. It is the primary way that God is known from the natural world, and it is the primary way that God relates to his creation. It continues a theme throughout his unpublished writings, theological writings, sorry, forming a central part of the non-Trinitarianism that was such an important part of his theological framework. I'll give you one example. Echoing the general scholium and providing a more detailed context, Newton describes the relationship between Christ and God the Father in his reconstruction of the now corrupted beliefs of the primitive church. And he says, and therefore as Father and his sons cannot be called one king on account of their being consubstantial, but may be called one king by unity of dominion, if the son be viceroy under the Father, so God and his son cannot be called one God on account of their being consubstantial. Nothing can make two persons one God, but unity of dominion. There's much more to the story. God's dominion has implications on Newton's views of predestination and salvation and his metaphysical voluntarism, some of which James Force has explored. And while I have no time to discuss it here, I believe that the absence of grace in Newton's system calls into question any claims that he held to predestination, although his view of God's government does appear to fit a voluntarist framework. Nonetheless, I want to move to a consideration of the attributes of God, his perfections. Using the language of classical theism, Newton labels God's attributes as perfections. He is eternal and infinite, omnipotent and omnipresent. Then he describes what he means by those things. His duration reaches from eternity to eternity. His presence from infinity to infinity. He governs all things and he knows all things that are or can be done. It is in his discussion of the attributes of God that Newton interacts more directly with the scholastic tradition. For Augustine and Anselm, God is his attributes. As Anselm states, thou art the life by which thou livest, the wisdom by which thou art wise, and so with all thine attributes. Newton, however, would not agree with this position. He says he is not eternity, he is not infinity, but eternal and infinite. He is not duration in space, but he endures and is present. He endures forever and is everywhere present. And by existing always and everywhere, he constitutes duration in space. He leaves us here with this enigmatic claim of that God constitutes duration in space. Uh, the Latin verb is constituo, to set up, determine, establish, or constitute. I, um, this is perhaps uh, debatable, but I'm wondering if the best translation, considering how Newton uses constituo elsewhere, might be that by existing always and everywhere, God gives duration and space its form or its properties. The immediate context for this discourse are the debates between Leibniz and the continental Cartesians. Moreover, the relationship between Newton's discussion of space in De Gravitatione has been considered, and it, sorry, between his discussion of space in the De, Gra De Gravitatione and the general scholium have been discussed in detail. Uh, Andrew Janiak is one of those examples. 
Here, however, I want to look specifically at how Newton is interacting with the classical theistic tradition. In an earlier draft of the general scholium, Newton refers to the monk stance. He says here, you can follow, um, his duration is not a monk stance without uh, duration, it's not an abiding moment without duration, nor is his presence nowhere. Uh, so we can see there this monk stance. It's also referred to as the tota simul by Aquinas. And it's a concept that God is timeless, but his eternity is not related to the normal passage of time. Aquinas cites Boethius as the source of this concept. And this is the um, Boethian comment. The flowing, um, the flowing instant produces time, and the abiding instant produces or makes uh, eternity. Newton objects to the scholastic notion. We can see it here. He, he objects to it here in the general scholium. He also objects to it in, the avert in a draft of the advertisement or lecture. He writes, the writers of uh, logic and metaphysics uh, treat immensity and endless duration or eternity as essential qualities. In this sense, the schoolmen made a nunc stance to be a eternity, and by consequence, an attribute of God. An eternal duration has a better title to that name, though it be but a mode of his existence. For a nunc stance is a moment which always is, and yet never was, nor will be, which is a contradiction in terms. And it is as much a contradiction to tell us that God is everywhere by his virtue, and nowhere by his substance. Yet some make this to be his ubiquity, and by consequence, one of his attributes. Rather, for Newton, God exists in time, but he has always existed. He is of endless duration, but a duration that has a literal past, present, and future. Similarly, he exists in space, but of infinite substantial extension. The relationship between God and space from Aquinas to Newton has been explored in detail by Edward Grant. However, a few comments are appropriate here. For Aquinas, while God is substantially present throughout the created world, that world is finite. Moreover, God is present to it uh, in a non-extended way, not being a body. So the presence is not an extended presence. Rather, God is present everywhere, maintaining the existence and properties of all things. This is based on his substance or essence as existence itself. He contains all things in a similar way to the way the soul contains the body, and he governs all things through his universal agency but everywhere still refers to the finite world. For Aquinas, God possesses an infinity not related to material limits, a non-extended infinity, which is separate, I think. Opposed to Aquinas' God present everywhere in his agency, Duns Scotus affirmed that God's supreme will enabled him to act at a distance, making him transcendent rather than literally omnipresent, a position adopted by Leibniz. Newton's conception, the concept of God's relationship to space is more in accord with Aquinas, Yet for Aquinas, for God to be substantially present is related to his essence, being. The world derives its continuous existence from God's essence. For Newton, God's eternity and infinity are not outside of time and space, and thus the necessity for God to be able to act on everything and know everything requires his substantial omnipresence. And part of God's essence is his supremacy, making the space in which he acts, the arena of his dominion, absolute, or in other words, constituting it as absolute. Let me make one final comment on Newton and the Jewish tradition, um, which Newton encountered through his reading of the Kabbalah and Maimonides, whom he, he references frequently in his theological papers, but usually not uh, related to these kind of topics for Maimonides. A number of scholars have considered the parallels between Maimonides and the theistic arguments of the general scholium, particularly Richard Popkin. These comparisons largely take the form of finding similarities between Newton's statements and those of Maimonides' Guide to the Perplexed, and the potential influence of Maimonides on Aquinas justifies the investigation. But I would like to consider here a specific classical Jewish concept which Newton uses to support this position. It was known in the 17th century Christian circles from the Kabbalah. In one of the general scholium drafts, Newton expands on his quote from Acts 1728, referring to how the Jews more correctly called God Markham. I have it in uh, Latin here. So Markham, this is a, actually a misspelling of Markham. It should be a cough and a uh, valve right here. But uh, Newton spells it different places, in different ways in different times, which calls into question a little bit, perhaps, how proficient he was in Hebrew. But um, anyway, so uh, the Jews rightly um, called, uh, called place Markham. Uh, sorry, the Jews rightly called God Markham, or place. That is the substantial place, um, sorry, the substantial essence to every place let me see, I have it here. Yes, to all places in which the apostle says we are placed and in which we live and move and have our being. 
Brian Copenhaver argues that Newton's use of Markham implies that God is the ground of place and thus distinct from it as condition from consequence. Newton tended to repudiate the Kabbalah as he did scholastic <coughs> metaphysics, associating it with the idolatrous distortions of the original worship of God, typical when speculative metaphysics is mixed with theology. Yet Markham was for him an avenue back to the Prisca Sapientia and rhetorically added to the ancient and scriptural authority invoked by the Act 17 quotation. All right, to conclude, I presented Newton as part of a continuous tradition of classical theism, which can be seen when his specific theological statements are placed in their traditional contexts. Looking at the general scholium through the theological categories of classical theism reveals systematic aspects at the boundaries of Newton's natural philosophy and theology. It makes explicit how central the concept of dominion is to, God's view of God's, uh, so to Newton's view of God's nature, but more so, it demonstrates the relative uniqueness of that position within the Christian theistic tradition. Moreover, this method allows us to see how God's nature as supreme or absolute suffuses his attributes and bleeds over into Newton's conception of the natural world. I've attempted to look at the general scholium not as a historian or philosopher, but as a theolo theologian, considering Newton in light of a theological tradition and trying to cast an already well-developed picture of his theology in a new and systematic light. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I understand we have, oh, about uh, 12 more minutes for uh, questions, and I understand I'm supposed to shepherd people to the microphone. <laughs> so why don't you? <laughs> you should have tripped him. I don't want to disagree too much. Um, number one, um, um, in the, you haven't given evidence that there is a cosmological argument in the general scholium, and you kind of implied that <laughs> uh, Aquinas' five ways are present in the general scholium, but the cosmological argument is a crucial aspect of this, and it's a striking contrast between Clark's way of proceeding, who spends a lot of time on the cosmological argument, and Newton's way. So I just think a uh, big star there. And number two, and this is more of a history of science point, um, Copernicanism complicates the notion of a classical theism. And I worry that uh, you have a very ecumenical approach to classical theism, but you see in a response to the Lutheran astronomers and then later in the Galileo affair that this construct, classical theism, comes under enormous pressure because the boundaries between revelation and the effects that we witness, um, let's say this, the classical theosynthesis uh, breaks down. And I think um, to suggest that there's a continuous tradition rather than an enormous reshaping in light of the Copernican controversy, first in Wittenberg, then in Reticus's Retic suppressed uh, preface, and then of course the Galileo affair, I think kind of implies more continuity than we should give justice to because I think part of what's happening in the 17th century is that they have to reinvent some of the major dividing lines of what you call classical theism. Um, okay. I mean, there's a lot more to be said about that, but I just wanted to express the reservation. Could you mention the first question again, sorry? First question is, cosmological argument is absent oh, in the general okay. scholium, and you pretend as if <laughs> Aquinas' five ways are kind of all there. No, they're not. In okay. Clark they are, but not in Newton. Okay, um, on the, on the I'll, I'll address the first one um, first and then the second one. I think that, yes, you can say the cosmological argument is not uh, articulated as a cosmological argument, but I think what I'm trying to say, and this perhaps will address the second question as well, is that we see um, themes, we see topics, we see ways of approaching the uh, knowledge of God, which, are, which were developed within the classical theistic tradition and come out in this, uh, in this document. Now, I wouldn't say that that's any different from other themes, but I'm wanting to just show that there is a, um, a longer tradition of reasoning about uh, God and his place 
uh, or, or God in his attributes and his nature, which, um, which we do see in even a document like the General Scolium, even if it's not necessarily a strictly, I, I don't think that Newton is drawing from Aquinas. I, I don't believe that. But I do believe that he's drawing from a tradition which Aquinas was influential in. And that's the same with the, yes, there is a make, there's a mix up, um, there's a, a change that's happening during the Reformation for sure, and also the switch back to uh, scripture as a dominant source rather than natural theology. But I do still see categories that are being used consistently across the tradition. The meaning of the category shifts dramatically given historical <coughs> crises or whatever you want to call it. And you make it sound like the categories are stable over this long tradition. And I think, well, I think so much about that as a reply. Okay. Oh, okay. for your paper. I, had, I enjoyed it very much. Um, but there's something that I would have, <coughs> damn voice, I would have emphasized differently. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the central conception of God in Newton. What he's saying is that God's existence is such that he cannot not be at any time, and he cannot not be anywhere. Oh, so somewhere, anywhere, yeah. He must be always he must be forever, all right? Yes. So this means that straight away, he's debarred from using any form of the ontological argument, okay? So um, what he's concentrating on in the general scolium and with related documents um, is the nature of God's existence. Yes. He's saying there's a sense in which divine existence is omnitemporal, okay? It's an omnitemporal eternity. And of course, that links immediately uh, and necessarily to uh, infinite space, yes. on, on unlimited space, and also, of course, to unlimited time. So I think we should um, stress uh, the oddness, as it were, of Newton's argument for the nature of divine existence. Hmm. You see, he doesn't argue from the central attributes of omniscience and so forth. He argues from the, the attribute of omnipresence. That's hmm. the central attribute for the anchoring so to speak, of a, a space and time. Okay, and that, that of course is the central anchorage for his natural philosophy. Okay, okay. So have I made myself clear? I would, uh, sorry, I would see perhaps, yeah, um, you're saying he's arguing from his omnipresence, but it seems to be he's arguing from so his supremacy. I'm so sorry. Sir. His supremacy, yes. which applies to space, time, and dominion. Uh, and yet, at the same time, dominion is also tied up into what it means to be a god. So it seems to me that the supremacy is still um, behind the omnitemperance as well. Classical, classical is beyond Newton, because of course, he says yeah. it's a necessary being of God. Yes. But he parses that necessity in terms of omnitemporality mm. and omnistatiality. Yes. I think that's what's got to be stressed. But I think he also parses it in terms of omnipotence. He, he doesn't argue being of God. No. It's the other way around. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then it doesn't yeah. stuff to do with my favorite. That's we'll true. Okay. Yep. <coughs> I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is a very rich topic and um, you've covered a huge amount of ground. One, one missing element, perhaps, in your story that might complicate the notion that he's using categories of classical theism <coughs> is, I think, the fact that he's extremely heavily influenced in his view of God's substantial omnipresent throughout space by Moore's Cambridge Platonic view. Mm -hmm. And now, if that fits in classical, classical theism, perhaps that's consistent with your opinion, although it seems to me he's taking a strong view, like Moore did against Descartes, in saying that God is extended. Yes. And we know that both from manuscript material, and I think it's clear in the general scholium too. And he's saying um, it's not just that God's power or vir virtue, 
or action is omnipresent, which of course everybody would agree with in, on some construal or other philosophically, but God's substance is omnipresent. And that is certainly from Moore's view, and we know that from very early in Newton's mm -hmm. life. And that is certainly a different view than what you might think of as a classic neo-Aristotelian idea. And Moore would mm -hmm. be presenting a, a sort of neo-Platonic view in contrast to that. So that might complicate the story of classical theism. But okay. maybe, as Eric says, you have such an ecumenical <laughs> idea that, that that even that is encompassed in it. Because uh, I think this is, I think this is sort of, because my question is, where does Moore get that from? And why does he, you know, what is his, the tradition that he's working within? And you can kind of go back to see, uh, even though there are arguments, there's new ways of working it, there's still these um, questions of how God relates with time and space and, and uh, creation are um, within a tradition of thinking about them, which starts with the classics. Just a quick historical comment. Mm -hmm. As you probably know, there's a long tradition of arguing for absolute space and time from God in the 17th century. Yes. Yeah. And we're going to see how Newton connects up with that. I've never been able to work it out. I tried to write a paper on that years ago. And bah. Mm. <laughs> yes. And so you, you work on that. You look at the well, <laughs> To be, to be honest, it's, it's in some ways, it's why I have kind of skipped back, partially because I feel that a number of presenters are going to be talking about well, that kind of concept. Yeah. 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 Yeah discussions of space, it's happening in a number of areas. But you're doing nice work. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think, yeah, we've got about three minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for, as, as I've already said to you, I think, you know, this is really important work. It's, you're doing absolutely the right thing. But one thing I did want to focus on, which I think touches on what other people have said, is to narrow it down slightly, and what mm -hmm. happens to what you call classical theism in the 17th century, in England mm -hmm. specifically. Because this way of doing theology, from God's mm -hmm. attributes, and then you build a systematic theology, that's the way theology is done at the start of the 17th century in a Calvinist framework. And they're mm -hmm. not necessarily using Calvin, they're using Palanus, they're using mm -hmm. Zanke, and then William Perkins actually does it in the English way. But that systematic way of doing theology <laughs> falls completely out of fashion with the defeat mm. of Calvinism in England. And the way people start doing theology is a much more historical theology. And as Scott has discovered, Newton went to theological lectures or studied with Joseph Beaumont. And the way Joseph Beaumont teaches theology is by doing a biblical commentary. He just goes through the passages of through Paul and comments on each one. He doesn't build a systematic theology. Yeah. Now that might explain, they'll still mention the attributes of God, it's still in there, but they don't do it systematically. And that might ex explain in a more short term way the form that Newton talks about it. He takes this, he takes that, but he's not doing systematic or classical theism as it's being done in, you know, your reformed scholasticism, to use a rather yeah. nasty, nasty phrase. Now, the question of omnipresence, which is one that Andrew raised in the last session as well, how does Newton know that God is omnipresent, right? This is in the scholastic tradition. First, you know that God exists from his works, and then, because the creator must be, uh, must have created everything and is omnipotent and so on, you get omnipresence from there. It doesn't mean you have a vision of exactly how omnipresence works, and this is what I'll talk about. But, but that's a, a pretty classical argument. You, you don't have a, um, you could have a metaphysics of omnipresence, but you don't need one. You can get omnipresence just from existence. It's a kind of logical corollary some, for something, and I think that might be the case for Newton. I don't yeah. know if you think. Well, I'm, I'm thinking more um, on your, your point on the scriptural the, the method of doing it. I think that's, to some degree, it's what I'm trying to bring out with, with the, where I was discussing the tension between natural and revealed theology. Um, and however, I feel that you still have, um, when you're doing natural philosophy, it's, there are these categories of discussions of God 
which go back um, into to, to the classical theistic tradition, which is what, um, which is where say you know natural philosophy is kind of works through right through Aquinas through the scholastics. Uh, so these categories are continuing, yet at the same time there is still this tension, which I think um, as as Eric is saying. Um, changes the emphasis or the way that we might relate to those classical theistic positions vis-a-vis -vis our now new uh, focus on scripture being the primary source. And I, I think that if we look at Newton's sources of theology, it does seem that he is much more of a publicist in that. I'm not trying to argue that he's... I, sh I should say, uh, you must be unfair to the Calvinists. They still start with the Bible, but they start with the main book. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, uh, to take a little privilege of being the chair uh, and not having any of your expertise on Newton, uh, but the thing I was noticing in your presentation was that the attribute of dominion being made, mm. in a sense, essential to God, and in a way, from the classical tra tradition, there'd be something problematic about that insofar as it presupposes a relationship with that which one has dominion over, namely creation. And to make that essential to God would, from a kind of classical point of view, be in a way requiring creation as inherent in God's very nature. Hmm. But if you have done what Newton's done, which is to elide eternity and temporality in the way that he has, so that uh, so that eternity, so that time and space are in some sense built into the very being of God, then in a way that shows you a sh shift that's happened relative to that classical separation of God and creation. Is this making some sense? I mean and that's why the Nunc stands doesn't make any sense for Newt, whereas yeah. for Augustine, Boethius, Aquinas, that captures the whole distinction between eternity and temporality. And yeah. a really interesting point. I don't think Newt can come clean on the unity of the divinity. Yes. That's a big issue for us. Yeah. I think we should look into that as well. Yeah, the unity. But that was just my little footnote. I should, we should bring this uh, session to a conclusion. Uh, and thank you so much for this fantastic. <laughs>